Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive, have no illusions. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you again at our wartime lecture series. Uh, after this small break, uh, we will have now the second round of uh, lectures. And uh, um, this is our project, Wartime Lectures, in which we reflect on the uh, everything uh, that's happened until uh, from the um, uh, since the uh, February 24 uh, and the full invasion of Russia into Ukraine, and also we reflect on the ongoing war. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be part of that project. Uh, my name is Anna Osipchuk. I'm a research director at School for Policy Analysis uh, at National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, which is one of the organizers of uh, this event, together with Alumni Association and uh, with the uh, Justus Liebig University at Gießen, um, who, uh, from which we also will have a representative today. I'm very happy uh, to welcome Tamara Marciniuk, who will, will be uh, um, uh, talking today at, uh, um, on women's resistance in Russia's war in Ukraine and presenting her findings and research and her reflections on that. And I am also very grateful to oh, Tamara Marceniuk is a professor, my fellow professor at uh, sociology department at Kiev Mohila Academy. She's also currently a visiting scholar as Leofana University Lunepe. Uh, I'm also very grateful to Professor Andreas Lanenol uh, from the University of Gießen, from, uh, if I remember correctly, Faculty of Social Science and Cultural Studies, who is a professor there. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Tavara, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for watching us uh, here and uh, visiting my lecture. So, uh, please, the slides appear on the screen. Thanks a lot. So, we, we had some small magic and uh, I will talk today on women's resistance in Russia's war in uh, Ukraine and uh, in my lecture, I will mention successes and challenges of gender equality politics implementation in Ukraine. Also, I demonstrate some results of public opinion surveys about uh, women's uh, resistance and uh, gender equality, especially in the military sphere. I will stress and talk on agency, uh, but also uh, mention some victimhood when we uh, analyze women's involvement in the war. Uh, I'd like to stress also that uh, I'll show the legacy of women's resistance since 2014, the Maidan protests and war in Donbass uh, that uh, lasts already for eight years. And I will analyze different forms of resistance. First of all, military one, but also volunteer community and cultural and symbolic. And actually part of title is so-called symbolic resistance where humor is uh, used. And I do... Um, I think that their analysis of women's participation in the war, it's possible to understand better, especially for the international community, why and how the Ukrainian society resists uh, after this terrible invasion. And uh, uh, when we analyze uh, sociologically and uh, in the gender and war uh, literature, uh, women's involvement in war, uh, we, uh, we could uh, uh, divide uh, two major directions. 
uh, first of all, in more West in Western literature on uh, gender and war, gender and nationalism, because very often wars are connected with. Uh, fight for independence of nations, uh, women are portrayed as victims of the war, victims of the situation and uh, those who suffer and who belong to the vulnerable groups. And of course it's true and uh, there is a, a direction of research where uh, uh, women are uh, in general and different groups of women, they are analyzed uh, through this victimhood uh, pr uh, uh, perspective. At the same time, in my lecture, I will uh, mention and I will analyze women uh, may, uh, mainly as actors of resistance, those who have agency and who uh, participate and in different forms of activities from military, as I uh, said already, to uh, cultural one. And actually it's uh, interesting that uh, after invasions there are uh, already a lot of different uh, visuality and uh, posters with uh, women's resistance. Uh, of course there are some uh, posters where women are portrayed as victims, especially those who, uh, uh, who were forced to evacuate with other family members, children, uh, elderly, but but um, I would say majority of posters are about women's resistance, uh, where you could see gender national symbols. And uh, actually, it's another very interesting direction of uh, research that I advise uh, some of you who are interested in this topic to 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 take and uh, to analyze more in my slides i uh, i will use some of this uh, uh, visuality with uh, agency of uh, uh, women uh, we can't analyze active participation and resistance of women without analysis of uh, uh, gender equality implementation in the Ukrainian society. Uh, when we look on the institutional level and on uh, politics, we could see that on at the national level, equal rights and opportunities for women and men is guaranteed in the Constitution of Ukraine, Article 24, Ukraine also among the first uh, former Soviet Union countries introduced particular law of Ukraine on ensuring equal rights and opportunities of women and men. At the international level, Ukraine also rat ratified major legislation that is about women's uh, rights and equal rights and opportunities. It's of course the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, famous CEDO. And uh, it's a great success that after invasion in July 20 uh, to uh, Ukraine also ratified the famous Council of Europe Convention on preventing and combat combating violence against women and domestic violence, so-called Istanbul Convention. But what is important as far as in Ukraine the war is already for eight years, that in the security, in the military sector, also uh, women's participation, women's agency is guaranteed first of all by United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. And uh, Ukraine already uh, uh, agreed on the second national action plan for the period till 2025 in October uh, 2020. And actually, we would say that uh, that uh, for the last eight years, especially this years uh, of war in Donbass, a lot was uh, done in the Ukrainian 
uh, armed forces and in the Ukrainian society to assure equal rights and opportunities for women and men in the military sphere and to, uh, to provide women more agency to participate in peace and security sector. Uh, and uh, in my research, I also uh, uh, I start actually from uh, analysis of Yevra Maidan protests in 2013-14 and women's participation. And in my uh, articles, I show that Ukrainian women managed. Uh, to challenge traditional gender roles, where they are uh, mainly as caretakers and victims of conflict, and they reclaim to visibility, recognition, and respect as revolutionaries and volunteers. So despite some scholarship about the uh, sexism and other discriminatory problems on the Yevromaidan protest, at the same time, it became possible to criticize Size, uh, this uh, sexism and for women to raise publicly uh, issues that are connected with agency, with women's participation in different, in very diverse forms of activities during Yevromaidan protests. The same happened when uh, war in Donbass started in 2014. Women joined front lines uh, as volunteers, journalists, medical staff, and as military also on combat positions. And there were some problems for the women um, in the very beginning. And... Uh, uh, I would like to mention a bit our uh, sociological uh, and uh, later advocacy campaign in Visible Battalion. In 2015, uh, it became clear that uh, after a year of war, there are women who are uh, in combat positions in different uh, uh, in different battalions, but they are not recognized uh, officially because uh, there was uh, a large list of professions forbidden for women, and uh, majority of uh, military professions were not actually, especially. Uh, those uh, who are combat ones were allowed for women. So uh, uh, Maria Berlinska uh, came, uh, who is uh, actually also alumna of Kiev Academy and who was doing a reconnaissance in the armed forces as a volunteer. She came with a proposition to do sociological research on the gender discrimination of women in the military as labor market. And uh, uh, we are... Uh, I and some of my other colleagues, uh, Anna Kvit, Anna Hrytsenko, and later others, we did sociological study uh, called Invisible Battalion, Women's Participation in Military Operations in the Anti-Terrorist Operation. And uh, uh, this study was, uh, de uh, was uh, conducted through liberal feminist perspective and public sociology perspective. And uh, the whole idea was actually in this metaphorical title, Invisible Battalion, because it's about visibility of women in the armed forces. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, so we, uh, we interviewed around 50 women and also around 10 men in the anti-terrorist operation. And uh, we discovered uh, not only some successful issues as for women's integration into armed forces in Ukraine, but some challenges that women face and presented these research results and it uh, appeared that uh, our women, our respondents, who were uh, we used anonymity uh, for uh, uh, for them, because uh, as you may guess, uh, it, uh, it's uh, uh, so we were uh, thinking also about the some ethical issues and their security. But uh, women, they agreed to be public in fighting 
for their labor rights in the military. And as a result, it became an advocacy campaign called Invisible Battalion. Below, you see a web page of this campaign and project. It was a documentary with six stories of uh, our uh, different hearings. So you may uh, look at this documentary also on this web page of Invisible Battalion. And later, uh, the project continued with some other studies. Uh, the second one was uh, 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 was about uh, the situation of uh, women veterans returning to peaceful life because uh, as a result of uh, Donbas war, in general, there were uh, there are probably now around half a million of veterans and women are very visible group in it and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, women's veterans movement is uh, quite i would say a uh, uh, visible actor in dif among different uh, veterans organization the said our study was on a very sensitive topic of sexual harassment in the military so in gender based violence that is important all, not only for women but men our idea of uh, our uh, a group of uh, uh, project campaign participants uh, were to make armed forces of uh, uh, ukraine uh, on a high professional standard level without uh, bullying without the soviet legacy armed forces problems uh, uh, as gender-based violence and a number of other issues so we managed to conduct this uh, this uh, research uh, and uh, there were there are also two court cases on sexual harassment and uh, in 2021 we also launched online course on gender equality and, and combating sexual harassment in the military for military but uh, also for uh, other interested groups it was on promote uh, it is on ukrainians uh, language platform uh, Prometheus uh, and co course is quite I would say is quite popular and uh, already hundreds of uh, military they took this course and uh, successfully finished it and can currently we uh, are uh, doing uh, research on women's access to military education because uh, uh, without uh, equal rights and opportunities in an education it's difficult to have this uh, situation with gender equality in the labor market. And uh, what we have now with uh, women in armed forces in figures. Of course, first of all, as you may guess, in general, the current data about women in uh, the war is uh, their close data. It's not so easy to, to find and to reveal them. But for the last two years, uh, at the end of the previous year, uh, the total number of service uh, women was around 33,000. Uh, uh, it's actually approximately 20% uh, of uh, armed forces are uh, women, like 17%. Uh, uh, so it's quite high level percentage of women in armed forces compared to uh, even to other NATO countries. Uh, for the years of uh, Donbass war, 17,000 women became veterans of war in Donbass. And I said that women's veterans movement is quite visible actor. Nine women from the armed forces of Ukraine died during the Donbass war. It became possible to challenge not only horizontal gender segregation of armed forces, but also vertical uh, gender segregation because in 2018, first Ukrainian woman obtained the, the status of the uh, general Lyudmila Shohalei. Currently, there are actually two women. And uh, our former president, Petro Poroshenko, in 2018 signed a law 
on equal rights for women and men while serving in the armed forces of Ukraine and other military formations. And women uh, got possibility uh, to, uh, uh, to serve uh, in armed forces, especially on contract basis, equally together with uh, uh, men to commit uh, military service. Also, it's equal access to positions in military ranks, equal responsibilities in the performance of military service. There are still some nuances when we talk about uh, military service, if you're interested, so ask uh, your question and I will uh, talk uh, on this more, especially when we talk about obligatory draft of uh, men in Ukraine. When we, uh, uh, so when we talk about uh, uh, women's participation in armed resistance, it's interesting to check uh, sociological data, results of public opinion polls, and uh, uh, so here you could see all Ukrainian national representative poll conducted by InfoSapiens for British agency. This data were public in the beginning of March, so actually almost like 10 days after a uh, full-scale invasion. And uh, it's a representative study and 67% uh, of Ukrainians are ready to personally participate in the armed resistance to end the Russian occupation of Ukraine. So it's majority. And uh, of course, there are some gender differences. Men are ready to participate more. And uh, um, I would say in general, as you could see from the percentage in the armed forces, Men are more learned and more uh, men have more experience. Uh, at the same time, 59% uh, of women uh, in the beginning of March were ready also to participate in the armed resistance. And women, they joined uh, territorial self-defense uh, in different regions of Ukraine. Currently, it's difficult to tell about percentage. Uh, I've got different data sometimes. Uh, like, I would say approximately 5% of uh, those who are in territorial self-defense are women. And uh, for women, were well, not so easy because it was lack of resources in general for uh, for all uh, and uh, of course the um, preferences would be given to uh, men compared to women also i uh, uh, being sociologist I can't avoid presenting some other interesting sociological data and uh, uh, there are uh, uh, the, it was questioned that women should be granted equal rights with men to work in the armed forces of Ukraine. It's actually what is already officially is and in 2018 uh, Ukrainian society was asked this question and it was repeated also after invasion in April 2022 and uh, with this uh, argument that women should have equal rights you could see that after invasion situation changed and those who a uh, percentage of those who agree completely with this statement it's almost doubled it was 24 percentage now 44 those who would rather agree than disagree also increased and in 2022 it's around 36 percentage uh, and you see uh, that uh, before difficult to say around 50 percentage of respondents they were difficult to say but now uh, percentage is very low and uh, in general, uh, of course, it's obligatory, especially in the situation of uh, full-scale invasion, that Ukrainian society supports the 
equal rights and opportunities of women and men to work in the armed forces and the situation was, uh, I would say, women's agency in the military. Another uh, second question is also very interesting because it's about uh, the model of the armed forces. In 2018, uh, this question was asked and four years later after invasion repeated uh, and our respondents were uh, proposed different uh, forms of armed forces. Uh, first one, it's uh, uh, enlistment of both men and women voluntary on contract basis. It's actually, I would say, the model that uh, uh, military women, my colleagues from invisible battalion they promote uh, promote professional armed forces uh, contract based uh, with equal access of women and men and you see that majority of uh, ukrainians they support this uh, uh, more than 60 percentage the second variant is conscription of all men and only of some women it's actually it's like Ukrainian model that is uh, now and we see that uh, uh, percentage a bit increased but still it's like 15 percentage in 2022 conscription only of men it's uh, the said popular but much less variant so-called israeli model conscription of all men and all women uh, before it was much less popular only around two percentage now four percentage but of course it's very difficult to i would say to arrange as far as the first variant was not so easy to i would say american variant was professional armed forces uh, contract based with uh, equal access but what is interesting in answers of these questions this one and previous the number of those who uh, are difficult to say is very low usually when ukrainian society is asked about uh, gender equality issues the percentage of undecided difficult to say around 20 25 but here especially with a situation of uh, war of course the society is much more undecided uh, about uh, about this and about women's uh, uh, agency in armed resistance. To summarize about successes of gender equality implementation in the security sector of Ukraine and uh, Armed forces, they really changed a lot. And when we look on women's participation, so we could see for eight years a number of changes. It's first of all, access of women to military occupations, among them combat ones, uh, air reconnaissance, uh, snipers, driving military vehicles, uh, etc. Around 100 uh, combat uh, positions were opened for women recognition of female veterans as i said it's rather visible group it's uh, gender equality in military legislation improved protection of uh, women from gender-based violence uh, and also of uh, men because actually uh, gender-based violence is also about men it's access to military education as uh, at all levels has been opened for girls a couple of years ago first girls and uh, military colleges for example famous uh, Ivan Bohun military college it's also uh, it's uh, Im uh, improvement of institutional mechanism of gender equality implementation in the security uh, sector actually uh, this uh, process started already uh, with uh, Viktor Yushchenko presidency and uh, in 2005 6 there were first, first gender advisors for example of minister of defense uh, and uh, i remember one of our expert natalia major former major natalia dubchak was uh, gender advisor for minister 
Minister of uh, uh, of Defense. But uh, this process it's uh, it continues, and there are uh, a number of gender trainings and education for staff, and also it's uh, in order to to to, to provide some. I would say professional uh, policy, you should do a sociological research. So it became possible, and it was before, but now even more, to provide sociological studies on different topics, uh, even on such taboo ones as uh, sexual harassment in the military. And we could face really a number of changes that happened in the Ukrainian armed forces where professionalism, dignity, uh, equal rights for for, for both women and men are, uh, I would say, uh, they step by step are becoming uh, values uh, and important issues for the armed forces. And of course, all this are very helpful for women's agency in the military and for their motivation to defend their uh, to defend their countries and to participate in a different uh, I would say in the different uh, activities that are sometimes not perceived as uh, activities for women what women do also what uh, women may uh, do in their agency to uh, to resist of course this list could be quite long and i have uh, i don't have enough time to provide all i would say variety of forms of resistance so i will stress only some examples and here you see the uh, uh, project, Invisible Battalion Project Initiator Maria Berlinska, uh, who is a veteran, volunteer, women's rights ad advocate, uh, and uh, she comes to uh, politicians, officials, and she lobbying for heavy weapons for Ukraine. You know, in more traditional discourse, uh, women are perceived as those who ask for peace and uh, who are more. I would say peaceful creatures and uh, the this discourse of heavy weapon is criticized uh, sometimes you know for militarizations etc but in the situation of uh, ukraine and uh, of survival of ukrainian nation and uh, uh, resistance uh, ukrainian women even those who are from human rights who are feminists they ask for a uh, weapon and they explain this and uh, another examples of uh, different resistance is uh, of course uh, in the uh, situation of human rights and uh, here you see Alexandra Matvichuk uh, who is a, a human rights defender she coordinates uh, documentation of war crimes tribunal for Putin coalition and in her speeches I was in some events with Alexandra and you know sometimes audience is uh, I would say very surprised that human rights defender asks publicly for heavy weapon to protect Ukrainian sky to close the sky recently uh, uh, you, uh, Alexandra and her NGO they received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, and and uh, the, I would say, documentation, the resistance in this international human rights arena uh, is also very important for, uh, for resistance. Uh, women but women's agency and uh, is also a very interesting topic in feminist discourse there are a number of debates uh, what uh, among different i would say uh, 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 directions of feminist 
feminism uh, should or not feminists ask for heavy weapon and here is another example where feminist and editor of online resource gender in details tamara zlobina she supports hashtag campaign arm ukraine now so in the international feminist community tamara and others so it's only some examples uh, just to provide case uh, studies and to illustrate my uh, my ideas she asks uh, for uh, for heavy weapon and other uh, feminists daria zimbaluk irina zamuraeva they wrote article in opinion uh, why we as a feminists must lobby for air defense uh, for ukraine and uh, they would argue that pacifism uh, kills and this pacifist discourse currently in the very current situation and i i think yes the, after especially yesterday's uh, case of uh, mass uh, rockets to ukraine you understand this completely and uh, this uh, activists uh, they claim that in general they are critical of militarization but they believe uh, that uh, Pacifism will kill and Russia's war crimes have left us with no option. So uh, uh, it's another direction of uh, feminist debates on the situation of women's agency. And if you have questions on this, uh, you may ask. I unfortunately don't have time to stop here, uh, uh, to stop uh, here more. And uh, uh, women's agency also is uh, in organizing and participating in a number of protests. Just some example of protest uh, in Berlin of embargo to Russian gas and oil, where I was also participating. And because majority of uh, those who were forced to evacuate and those who are refugees are women, so they do a lot of activities and organize a lot of protests to pay attention of international community towards Russia, uh, uh, towards war and Russia's crimes. Another example of resistance is connected with, uh, of course, uh, captivity. And here is another example where uh, Minister of Reintegration of the Temporary Occupied Territories of Ukraine, Irina Varyshuk, in April, sorry, it's a mistake, it should be 2022, published a photo of Ukrainian soldiers liberated from Russian captivity and there were 15 women and uh, you see that despite the fact that uh, they uh, their hair uh, was shaved they are still they uh, have their dignity and uh, Ukrainian scholar Marta Havryshko who studies uh, war and uh, gender based violence in war she uh, as she says that it's a cruel attack on women's bodily integrity and intimacy because of the cultural meaning of hair for women. Hair is a, a strong conjunction with femininity, women's self-perception and dignity, but even despite the fact that these women, uh, they are in this situation, uh, it's possible to see that uh, 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 that uh, women uh, they suffer from uh, uh, all this uh, uh, violence, but still they have uh, uh, their dignity is uh, with them. Also, the ro the women's agency is recognized in Ukrainian culture. And uh, Kalush Orchestra won Eurovision this year with the song Stefania. Uh, and this song, when you watch the clip and you listen to words, it's actually, it contributes to the visibility of tens of thousands of Ukrainian female soldiers who defend their country, their home and their children. Also, I would say that despite uh, that uh, women resist not only on the uh, 
military volunteer community based level but uh, it's uh, uh, this war is also about symbolic resistance where humor is used and one interesting topic and actually i used this citation in the title of my lecture divchatka za krimo nebo girls let's close the sky uh, ukrainian witches uh, and witchcraft is in a very interesting topic uh, for and mythology for Ukrainian society, for Kyiv capital, uh, and it's used uh, also as women's uh, agency and the situation where, you know, hashtag I, I, close the sky, arm Ukraine now, uh, it uh, doesn't help. So there is this, you know, there are the self-made posters and humor where women on this symbolic level they try to protect ukraine and uh, it's uh, this symbolic cultural level is an interesting direction of uh, uh, research and women's resistance and i hope that i will continue it and hope for uh, cooperation with my colleague from the history department katarina disa who is expert in uh, witchcraft issues and just uh, almost the last slide uh, about the uh, this cultural or symbolic resistance uh, uh, there is popular uh, which spells song vraja enemy from uh, Andy Crada where actually uh, poetess Lyudmila Horova she wrote poem vraja enemy and uh, it's written in the form of a witch spell against enemies and it was published uh, uh, on the internet in uh, april and the words uh, went viral very quickly and uh, here there is a link you may google actually it also to watch this clip it has english subtitles and it's about also how on cultural symbolic resistance level this uh, magic could be used. Сію тобі в очі, сію проти ночі. Буде тобі враже так, як відьма скаже. Скільки в святу землю впало зеренджи, та стільки разів буде тебе враже вбито. And uh, it's, uh, I would say, I will uh, uh, finish my lecture here with uh, this uh, uh, again with this mentioning that uh, this uh, resistance could be on different uh, uh, on different uh, level and it's very wide uh, topic of uh, analysis and i am uh, uh, very grateful for your attention and will be uh, glad to answer your questions Yeah, uh, thank you, Tamara, very much for uh, for this lecture and a, a lot of information. And uh, uh, I want to remind everyone: please post your co uh, post your questions or comments in the comment section under the videos and broadcast. And uh, now I want to give word to Andreas for your comment, please. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank all initiators and organizers for this uniquely remarkable opportunity to engage in an academic conversation about the war against Ukraine, even as it is ongoing. This is an academic contribution to having the forces of society persist, uh, precisely as Ukrainian cities and critical infrastructure are shelled again. Um, it would be uh, an error to reduce society to, pass uh, to passivity and victimhood. Instead, it is necessary to make it visible in its complexity and multi-layeredness. And I think that Tamara's talk helped me a great deal in this regard, making society visible even when it comes to war. So I am very grateful for being given the opportunity to comment on Tamara Martenyuk's most impressive account of how women participate in the armed struggle against Russia's aggression on Ukraine, and also how they resist being pushed into all too familiar gender stereotypes like that of the weak woman becoming a victim, seeking shelter, or merely giving care. This is all the more remarkable as these stereotypes are usually notoriously replayed, particularly in times of violence and armed conflict. 
This is a strong evidence of the, of, uh, the civil society forces in Ukraine to resist aggression and authoritarianism alike through societal and legal self-organization that impact back onto state institutions. And my comments today will focus precisely on this interrelationship between the military, the armed forces, as part of the executive branch uh, of the state on the one hand, and civil society um, and the role of uh, um, diverse organizations and associations, crucially including women's associations in it, and how this interrelationship between the army and society actually might be conceptualized and might be researched and investigated into. Tamara's paper directs our attention to the necessity to readdress the relationship between society and state institutions, including those institutions which usually show a high degree of closeness, clandestineness, and hierarchy, like the armed forces. This is all the more important with respect to Ukraine, where the population has, according to many social scientific studies, for a long time shown a great degree of distrust in government institutions, such, for instance, as the parliament, and according to many accounts, suffered from an alienation of the people from the political institutions more generally. The armed forces, as an institution that belongs to a branch of the political system, the executive, brings the dilemma of the relation between people and democratic state institutions to the fore, namely that state institutions rely on trust and legitimacy among the population, but cannot generate trust or legitimacy them according to their own devices. They depend on society in this respect. On the one hand, the military urgently requires legitimacy, legitimacy as a rule, of course, in times of peace more than in times of war. Yet on the other hand, the military is usually one of the most arcane and impenetrable branches of the political system. Hence, the army and the societal engagement and participation it permits or it is urged to permit is a very important indicator of the interpenetration of civil society and state institutions. In this respect, the degree to which the armed forces of Ukraine have been exposed to societal and legal screening, as showed in Tamara's paper, and in line with international norms and conventions is remarkable. Um, I have to add that as somebody who is not an expert uh, on the relationship between the military and society, I can only refer to citizen knowledge on that question which of course means in my case, regarding the position of the, uh, of the German armed forces within society. In Germany, it is a notorious debate to what degree the armed forces are really part of society, as the doctrine of the so-called national citizen uniform had it, which was the mantra of the apologists of mandatory military service. But in the light of Tamara's presentation, I emphatically agree that a litmus test for the mutual integration of the military and society is the openness of the political system and the military administration to civic and legal contestation. And as Tamara also shows, women, women's organizations and uh, associations that represent women's interests play a crucial role in, uh, in this regard that is in order to increase the openness of um, the armed forces um, and to, uh, as it were, transform um, military institutions into more open institutions for an open society. Um, now I want to move to um, some questions that I have uh, regarding um, uh, um, Tamara's presentation and the research underlying it. And these questions regard the, they are future uh, forward looking in the sense that they regard the longer term or the potential longer term societal impact of the amazing participation of women in the armed resistance of Ukraine against the Russian aggression. So these questions are not merely speculative in nature, at least I hope, but they aim to address structural changes in Ukrainian society as they are ongoing and they all regard the, interpen the, the, the interpenetration between society on the one hand and the, ar the armed forces on the other hand. The first question would be this. How can women's achievements attained through participation in the armed forces be secured beyond the threat to Ukrainian state and society that is constituted by the Russian aggression? Um, that is, uh, how would the outlook be um, uh, for um, the uh, participation of women in the armed forces beyond this armed conflict? In particular, I would uh, ask you to elaborate a bit more on what can be learned from women's increased participation in society and the public after the Ma Maidan protests, which you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation, for their sustained participation in the army. That is, 
is it possible to maybe observe a kind of similar pattern of how women systematically are, are able to um, represent their interests uh, regarding participation in society? That is a potential analogy between what happened after the Maidan protests and what is potentially happening now with respect to uh, women uh, in the armed forces. The second question would be this. How can the military serve as an example for women's participation in society more broadly? Um, for instance, you mentioned some examples for women's associations that seem to interconnect the concerns and interests of women in the army with broader societal concerns. For instance, you mentioned the Invisible Battalion, but also women veteran groups um, uh, that, are, as it were, um, um, uh, uh, become publicly visible, visible in society, even as they were not so much visible in the army. So my, the question would be, how exactly do those groups and associations build a bridge between the army and civil society? And are there other instances where women for, form associations um, around um, armed activities that are transmitted into society and which have structural effects there? Um, my last question would be this. Um, uh, you were mentioning um, um, feminist uh, positions toward the end of your presentations. Um, and of course, there's not just one feminism, but there's yeah, feminism is a very plural and diverse field. Um, how, however, there is one longstanding debate in many of those different feminisms. And this debate regards um, the question whether it's enough to demand women's participation in traditionally male-dominated professions, occupations, and institutions, um, or whether the institutions themselves must undergo structural change beyond simply, as it were, including uh, 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 other segments of the population into themselves. Um, in your presentation, you highlighted certain changes um, that were introduced to the army um, um, as a result of increased women's participation, which seem to be of a structural nature, for instance, the gender training that you mentioned, um, increasing awareness, but then also the official recognition of women's interests in the army. And on that basis, and taking into account that um, uh, the, uh, an increase of the participation of women in any societal institution often heralds uh, significant structural changes in society as a whole or in, in the institution, my question would be whether there are other indications that the Ukrainian army, apart from more openness to female participation, is undergoing institutional change. Um, once again, thank you very much for allowing me to participate as a discussant in uh, uh, this conversation, and I look forward to furthering the conversation. Thank you. And dear Andrea, thanks a lot for your comments and questions. And they are actually, as I see, they are uh, uh, mainly connected to with the armed forces, civil society changes, some structural changes uh, when more women are uh, in the armed forces. And I, uh, first of all, so I'll start with the first one question of uh, uh, more. Uh, uh, more uh, women and uh, changes and uh, of course first of all I'd like to say that we should look uh, on the armed forces as a labor market and uh, analyze it uh, sociologically and I do this uh, through gender segregation vertical horizontal I mentioned this as a labor market and uh, it's interesting to compare the status of armed forces in Soviet times uh, and gender relations there and after collapse of Soviet Union. And uh, it's interesting also to see some, as for women's participation in war and armed forces, some, I would say, uh, historical, even if we are not historians, yes, but to see some tendencies, because the similar tendencies were in the Second World War. And actually, in our first sociological study, we used uh, also some historical literature, and we were in, uh, inspired by the uh, book of Svetlana Alexievich, uh, Belarus writer and journalist, uh, about uh, uh, the war doesn't have a women's face, where uh, she interviewed Second World War female veterans after 
in their, you know, uh, after they returned to peaceful life. And you may see that uh, uh, actual state very often uses women as reserve labor force. And it happened in the Second World War, where women were actively integrated in different positions. And they were used by state propaganda uh, for the on, but only some, uh, the uh, Red Army, for example, uh, consisted of a lot of women. Uh, only some of them were used by state propaganda, for example, uh, 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 very famous sniper Lyudmila Pavlyuchenko, who is by origin from Ukraine, from Odessa, uh, she was uh, used by Soviets uh, to uh, to come to US to open the second front to show that. Uh, in, in the situation, even women, they fight, they do male work, so-called. But later, when uh, war, uh, when it was victory, these women, they returned home and they were accused uh, of not of doing something wrong and bad in the armed forces yes uh, their motivation was like disgraced that they were coming uh, to armed forces to find husband or not to give birth whatever uh, these stories actually we were finding also in our interviews and we our respondents and also the uh, activists of uh, women's veterans movement so they were uh, as for visibility and recognition and dignity uh, so they were stressing on this because uh, you know in my lecture i couldn't uh, mention some a lot of problems but they were they are there are some his lessons from the history and uh, but it became possible with this discourse of dignity because uh, Yevromaidan it's about its revolution of dignity and this discourse of dignity for women and in general for some men because uh, armed forces as a labor market faced a lot of challenges after collapse of say, Soviet Union it became not prestigious for men and uh, men's masculinity to serve in army uh, men they were uh, according to legislation uh, Ukrainian legislation all women men they should have uh, obligatory ar service in army so there is obligatory draft and for men in order to avoid this so they use different corruption mechanisms they some of them they were entering institutional education to avoid army and uh, it's uh, so there are a number of structural problems there were in the armed forces as an institution that lost its prestigious lost money and percentage of women in general was quite uh, high uh, in post uh, in uh, post-soviet ukrainian society because actually men left it uh, due to the lack of money and resources women were uh, but they were on a more traditional female lower paid lower status positions and it was also another challenge, uh, uh, you know, especially uh, uh, so one of the situations that uh, activists they wanted to change the perception of uh, armed forces uh, and uh, i would say uh, the uh, to avoid uh, to to fight uh, some structural problems not only for women but for men uh, because if men I, in ideal world of equality if men don't want don't feel that they are ready to uh, you know to uh, uh, to sacrifice uh, some years of their life uh, in this service to work in the armed forces why they should and you know in the stereotypical perceptions the gender stereotypes they influence not only women but also men and this notion of dignity and professional armed forces it's also i would say it's not about uh, women and femininity it's also about men and masculinity and it's an idea that professionally trained people 
uh, it's, I would say, idea of gender equality, but also gender neutrality, that if person fails, that he or she is ready to uh, work in the armed forces and to sacrifice their life in this uh, military sphere, so they can and should do this. And I would say, to answer also some other, uh, the next questions, that actually what is interesting that uh, some of uh, female veteran activists, they were fighting, uh, for example, with gender discrimination of men in the armed forces because uh, men are not seen uh, a state, uh, the in general state and armed forces as institution, they see as a parent mainly woman. So men are not seen and uh, as a parent in the armed forces, and the men uh, face discrimin gender discrimination as uh, fathers. So they provided some changes also in uh, uh, e uh, e uh, there were some slight changes. Of course, you know this, as you said, uh, armed forces are very uh, traditional, very, uh, I would say, institutions that are very difficult to change. And uh, it's another issue and challenge what, how it may be changed if more women would come. Of course, we can't, uh, you know, as uh, the same as with politics, as with gender quotas, so we can't uh, rely only on numbers. And uh, that is why this uh, liberal idea of more women, better quality is criticized by, for example, critical radical feminism that says that uh, some uh, background uh, changes uh, of uh, armed forces of uh, a strong hierarchy bullying uh, and uh, a lot of problems, uh, violence is a very violent militarized uh, structure. Uh, it's also so these issues uh, are also very important. And in our case, you know, we start, uh, it can't be made through fast threat strategy. So uh, uh, this uh, Invisible Battalion campaign chose an incremental threat strategy, where you see even by the topic of uh, research, firstly, it was on just women's participation, later veterans, and then uh, problems of sexual harassment, gender based violence uh, uh, suicide is another very i would say uh, important topic that is very difficult to raise in any arm, armed forces but uh, in the situation of uh, post traumatic stress disorder suicide and all these issues that are connected actually with i would say dignity uh, uh, dignity in armed forces so you are absolutely right that in feminist discourse it's very very important uh, to uh, criticize, to change uh, this uh, uh, armed forces as a structure, but is what is more important that from this, uh, uh, I would say, gender equality, men also will benefit because when it will be uh, less suicide, less bullying, so it's, I would say, uh, uh, and uh, why women uh, bring this? Because it's still more diversity. Our society is very diverse. Women constitute half of, <laughs> half of population and uh, different women and in ukrainian armed forces some other changes that are happening the another visible group is lgbtq people uh, you know in uh, former soviet union societies the litmus test for democracy is uh, attitudes towards lgbt and homophobia and uh, uh, armed forces as a very like uh, traditional hegemonic masculine structure is actually homophobic but uh, when Voidon was started and uh, there were a lot of veterans so of course in such in a half a million of people uh, it can't uh, there is visible group of LGBT veterans and they have even their own organizations and some activists so they uh, uh, they coming out publicly uh, they join uh, uh, gay prides even during the war so for this eight years of war I would say for last years LGBT 
uh, LGBT veterans and military, they are visible group and attitudes towards LGBT issues in Ukraine also changed. It became less uh, homophobic. And you know, in this discourse of uh, Ruski Mir, because uh, uh, there is uh, this, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, the Russia and so called Ruski Mir, how they construct a uh, uh, discourse of. Uh, as of Europe and NATO, and this homophobia is a very present because of this notion of gay Europa, and uh, so it's uh, the, the, uh, it's uh, interesting to see that this diversity and recognition in the armed forces it may challenge its uh, I would say uh, the problems that are. Uh, that are inside uh, and uh, uh, we really experience these uh, changes and a uh, new generation of uh, people came to armed forces and uh, those who are, you absolutely right, that there is connection with uh, also civil society organizations in Ukraine. Uh, uh, Ukraine is, uh, uh, I would say, volunteer organizations and this uh, grassroots activism became a norm for the last eight years. And you could see how, uh, for example, people, uh, they fundraise, uh, they do different grassroots activities and that they do the same with armed forces. So actually they, from one hand, rely on armed forces and state trust to armed forces increased a lot. And uh, uh, so, and uh, um, uh, at the same time, they, you know, there is this internal or external locus of control where the problem was the issue of Soviet people that you rely on state, first of all. You have this external locus of control that state should uh, do for you this or that. Uh, but there is also this internal locus of control where you believe that you can benefit and could do some little steps to make changes in armed forces, yes, in general, uh, in, in the situation. So this grassroots challenge and the whole, this project invisible battalion it's like public sociology project and ideas driven by these groups of military women who suffer gender discrimination so it's not i would say uh, academia driven uh, project but more uh, more grassroots and it's a very interesting case study to uh, to see how with this incremental track strategy step by step uh, some changes are uh, are possible, but uh, not very fast, of course. And of course, still there are uh, there are some problems. But uh, uh, even despite the problems, I'd like to say that the there were a lot of changes for eight years of war because we shouldn't forget that when Ukraine is for eight years, and uh, we see the huge. A huge changes even on the discourse of public political level. President Zelensky he mentions Ukrainian language is gender sensitive, and from one hand it's like male door normative, especially as for professions. All prestigious status professions they have uh, mainly male forms, and female forms are um, for they exist, but for lower prestige, lower status profess uh, professions where majority are uh, women. So even in language, it's not I would say useful to use these feminine forms. In our sociological study, we use it consciously. And now, uh, for the 20 years of also visibility in language of uh, women in some professions, we, you see that president uses zakhisniki uh, izakhisniti. Uh, male and female defenders and uh, in a couple of days it will be day of uh, uh, male and female defenders of Ukraine. Uh, so it's also one of small victory even on such uh, a, a discursive level as language because la language absolutely sensitive and could change the depends on so social changes and demand yes from the uh, from the society
so probably i will stop here i hope i will i i uh, answered all your uh, uh questions but like uh in in all together thank you very much indeed yeah we have uh, we have a question and uh, we, we actually have uh, uh, several comments uh, uh, in in which uh, uh, our orders thank you for the lecture. Uh, but uh, we also have a question from Katerina Roshuk. What do you think? Uh, what else can society and the government do to combat gender stereotypes and support women's mental health? Thanks a lot uh, for the question. As uh, as I said. Uh, a lot is done, but it's very important as educator and education activist, I would say, that we should pay more attention to education, especially secondary education, because now with uh, war and uh, these military threats, we should uh, absolutely, I would say, change uh, gender uh, segregation in the secondary education when we talk about professional training, both medical and paramilitary training for children. You know that still in our schools uh, there are uh, different types of trainings and it's not so easy to get, uh, I would say, to get proper uh, uh, proper courses for girls and boys. So I would uh, stress on uh, changes of uh, uh, sex uh, of uh, secondary education uh, and to omit uh, gender segregate uh, gender segregation classes, less gender stereotypes and more visibility. Uh, of women, uh, not at it as it was after Second World War, where actually in all postures, mainly men were soldiers and women, those who greet uh, uh, who greet soldiers uh, uh, from uh, from victory, uh, and of course it's important uh, to to change sometimes some textbooks, uh, so to include more. Uh, to, to to have uh, uh, this uh, secondary education uh, with uh, uh, less gender stereotypes. Media is another, I would say, important factor of uh, gender stereotypes and uh, uh, women's and men's mental health. Uh, so it would be uh, nice to have a bit different. So now, of course, uh, uh, we uh, uh, we uh, it's not. I would say the maybe a first priority issue, but for for future programs, TV shows, still, uh, you know, on a discursive media level, uh, there are still strong stereotypes where for women is more important, you know, to find husband, uh, and where even like motivation for women to to go to military to arm to army on the front line could be sometimes portrayed as like to you know uh, to to find husband whatever. So not patriotic, but more individual. It could be, but it should be more diversity. Uh, so media, education are very important. Uh, and more, we ratified a uh, convention of elimination of uh, gender-based violence. And now it's very important to implement all the issues step-by-step. Uh, uh, step. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, also, it could be nice to move forward more uh, and to improve military education. Officially, women uh, have access to military education, but sometimes uh, still needed to to do infrastructural changes because uh, still, despite of uh, gender neutrality, there is this gender sensitive approach where women should have uh, should live in a particular separate. Uh, accommodation and uh, uh, so uh, improvement of military education I think it's uh, another 
uh, in another issue and more on the political level on the level of decision making still it would be nice to see more women near President Zelensky, because sometimes uh, there are women among um, the military elite, uh, uh, but uh, not enough. Uh, it would be nice, of course, to have more, uh, to include more, uh, 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 more women and for the society to see uh, more women who are do who are ministers who are deputies yes who are doing also important uh, work uh, as for mental health in general i would say the problem of course of post-traumatic stress disorder and all other psychological problem that uh, are they important for women but also for men and in general you know suicide level uh, among men are higher and uh, men are less ready to talk about psychological problems so as for uh, health issues uh, and as i said from uh, less gender stereotypes and more equality men also will benefit and it will be uh, in a better uh, in a better health because when they are less uh, strong gender norms less uh, strong expectations uh, from men it will uh, later benefit uh, so uh, men will benefit more on the also so psychological stability and in general health yeah yeah, yeah thank yeah. you uh, thank you for the answer we, we have a couple of more minutes and I actually wanted um, to ask uh, probably some questions from myself uh, 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 if, if I may, <laughs> you then this opportunity. Uh, uh, you, you've touched uh, that briefly, that uh, um, for a lot of feminist out of, and feminist activists out of Ukraine, uh, the, um, uh, let, let's, um, the, uh, um, let's say the agenda of, uh, let's, uh, that we are for peace, we are against fighting and against war and military in any form, is very important. It's actually very much pushed forward. And uh, do you see, uh, so my question is, do you see it's a big problem here for Ukrainian activists, feminist activists to actually, um, should they try to persuade uh, the uh, mainstream feminist, feminist in the West uh, mainly that um, the, the uh, let's say, uh, the uh, um, cause is worth fighting or should it, they just disregard that and proceed with their own agenda yeah thanks a lot it's a uh, really very important and sensitive issue and of course uh, 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 what we see after invasions that there were a number of uh, uh, online and offline meetings with uh, different feminists uh, organized uh, in, and initiated also by international feminists who would like to demonstrate their solidarity and to talk on uh, this uh, sensitive uh, issues of uh, women, uh, peace, security and uh, uh, mi military. And uh, I think that, of course, uh, uh, Ukrainian feminists, they are doing this, uh, even despite the lack of emotional, especially resources, you know, uh, because when you have uh, bombs uh, on your head and you should think on survival, it's very difficult uh, to have energy to persuade. Uh, what we, I would say, as Ukrainian feminists lack, it's really, and we need time. And what, uh, as a result of these meetings, I see that uh, we should, uh, because what we can uh, provide uh, now for the short period of time, it's only like our, uh, you know, uh, our emotions, our. Uh, examples explanations why we ask for a heavy weapon so what we need for uh, i would say future it's of course more uh, more uh, theorizing 
and uh, a more uh, intellectual criticism of this literature that is uh, on the issue of gender and war, gender and nationalism, because, of course, uh, you know, uh, 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 very often this literature is written by intellectuals who are from countries that are mainly... Uh, you know, they've never been under uh, invasion like Ukraine or those who are more like intellectuals and uh, theorizing from one hand is very important but on the other hand there are some uh, there are some nuances that are uh, was, uh, connected with this so-called like your standpoint, your experience, your autoethnography. So in future, uh, we need uh, to have some time to challenge uh, this uh, series of, uh, I would say, uh, victimhood uh, uh, and uh, theory, uh, uh, this uh, where women are victims, especially in the situation of uh, uh, gender and war and uh, uh, issues that are connected with gender and nationalism. To explain, uh, to explain this very rich empirical material that we have now uh, for last eight years with. Uh, more terminology, more, se uh, more theories. So if you have time and inspiration, I encourage those of you who are especially from academia to think on like developing more, uh, to, to, ex uh, to think on this, how to explain this uh, empirical material with some, uh, uh, with a theoretical, to develop some theories on, on it. But of course, debates are so. There are a number, and there were a number of debates. And uh, uh, in this situation, classic uh, division of feminism, where you see, you know, uh, where you see that liberal feminism is, uh, from one hand, critical or radical feminism is uh, criticizing this. But in this, uh, uh, in a Ukrainian example, uh, you see that even those feminist who's been criticizing for example our project invisible battalion because as i said it's a liberal feminist project uh, and it was criticized not only uh, by other groups but by some feminists uh, so now they rethink and they change this position and i showed on slide for example some explanations uh, uh, of uh, this uh, asking for heavy weapon and this the need for uh, the need for survival and the impossibility of peaceful dialogue because another issue that is also very popular for example here uh, uh, popular in germany is peaceful dialogue and if it's possible or not uh, uh, for women for example of the of Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus to have peaceful dialogue. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, um, thank you very much. And I, I think it's time uh, for us to be finishing up today. Uh, I thank you again to Tamara and thank you again to Andreas uh, for uh, taking part today. For uh, this, uh, probably not uh, uh, just a uh, a debate but uh, some introduction to discussion and some reflection and um uh, yeah and thank you to everyone who's been watching uh, so again uh, we'll see uh, each other i invite everyone to join next week when we have uh, yuri gorodnichenko who will talk on economics matters uh, related to the uh, full-scale invasion again thank you tamara thank you andres and uh, uh, goodbye to everyone. If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive. Have no illusions.